Step the time on there, Baba. Key J. Okay, I guess I'll just start with the beginning. <laughs> yes. I was born in California in 1959 on February 1st. So I had exactly 10 years with Baba, still on the, in the body. Um, now in about 1962, when I was three, I was given a book of ballet, about a ballet dancer. Okay, I was born uh, in 1959 in California, and uh, when I was about six months old, we started moving east. And by the time I was two years old, we ended up in New Hampshire. So I had gone from one coast to the other. Live there. <laughs> so in 1963, somebody gave me a book about a ballerina. And that was, that was it. About a baba? About a ballerina. A ballerina. Yes. So from that point on, I waited four long years. <laughs> Before my mother opened the back door of our house one day, and my sister and I were playing in the backyard, and she said, Oh, Amy and Rika, I've signed you up for ballet class. Oh. You were seven. I was seven. And I was ecstatic. It was life began that day when the back door opened. My sister said, Oh, ballet. <laughs> and I said, Oh, ballet. <laughs> So that was the beginning. I said, yes, ballet, ballet, ballet. <laughs> and we started taking class, I think just one day a week we went to class. And all the other kids in the class, including my sister and a couple of neighbors who joined us, would be, when we would be doing the Grand Batma, they would <laughs> but I was very serious, and I would ignore everybody kicking me in the fanny. <laughs> I took my dancing very seriously. <laughs> By the end of that first year, just about everyone else had dropped out but me. And, uh, and then, I think starting the second year, I was taking now two or three classes a week. My ballet teacher was named uh, Mrs. Ashton. And Mrs. Ashton had danced with the Metropolitan Opera oh. in New York under the direction of Margaret Kraft oh. as the ballet mistress. And another dancer in the company was Tex Hightower. Oh, wow. So all this was in the background. And then I think it was probably by 1967, I started hearing this name, Miss Kraft. Miss Crass, Miss Crass, Miss Crass wouldn't like that. <laughs> oh, little Miss Crass wouldn't allow that. <laughs> so Miss Crass became this black cloud over my little head. <laughs> I was terrified of Miss Crass. <laughs> from really from like the age of eight, nine, ten, I was just terrified, and I actually developed ulcers. I was so worried about. You know, just, I think any, I, you know, I took things very seriously. My dancing seriously, and, and then there was like this, this cloud and this crass was always there. And, and I would get, I would get these terrible pains in my stomach and I wouldn't be able to breathe and I would just start crying until it would pass. Oh. And so they gave me medicine for ulcers and, and then I could normally do okay, but there was this one side of me. That was triggered by somehow Miss Crass. <laughs> 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 so, the name. 1969, at the age of 10, my ballet teacher, Mrs. Ashton, decided that she was going to take, I, I can't recall if it was three of us or four of us, to New York City to meet Miss Crass. <laughs> oh my oh. god! <laughs> so oh, we had to ask our parents' permission and we had to get. And we probably got a hundred dollars. This is from New Hampshire. This is from New Hampshire. Yeah. So we, I don't think we got more than like a hundred dollars, maybe a hundred and fifty dollars, which seemed like an enormous sum from our parents, so we could get the bus to New York City. So everything was arranged, and we were going to spend, I guess, four or five days in New York City taking class with Miss Kraft. So we took the bus, and we arrived in New York City on October. 16, 1969. Oh, wow. wow. New life. Wow. New life after Bacalet, before Bacalet. 
That's the beginning of the movie. Oh, well, it's also the day the Mets won the World Series. <laughs> So, we arrived in New York City, we got off the bus, we went to our hotel room. Our hotel just happened to be the one that Miss Crass lived in, but we didn't know her. It was called the Wellington, and she lived in the, Re- the Wellington Hotel, and she lived in the residential section. Which, is, which part of New York is that? This was right next to Carnegie Hall, just around the corner, on 7th Avenue and, and 15th, 56th, yeah. right in that area. So, um, close, to Central Park. close to Central Park, close to Carnegie Hall. So we, we got off the bus, we ran to our hotel, and very quickly changed into our tights and leotards so that we could then throw our, our clothes back on and, and take a taxi down, Fifth Ave, down to Fifth Avenue and between 13th and 14th Street, which is where Miss Press Studio was. Well, everyone else. You know, the children's class, Miss Crass children's class, was what we were going down to take. <clears throat> and she never allowed outsiders in this class, but somehow my teacher, Mrs. Ashton, had this very special relationship with Miss mm-hmm. Crass that allowed her to bring students just randomly to take class with, with Miss Crass. It was the, we were like the only people I ever saw do that. Mm-hmm. And so we uh, we got in the taxi cab to go down to have our first class with her, and that was the minute that the, the moment that the Mets won the World Series. <laughs> so we drove through this spontaneous ticker tape parade. <laughs> Uh-huh. It was amazing because it was the first time I was seeing skyscrapers, and not only were we seeing skyscrapers, but every window of every skyscraper had tons of ticker tape and carbon paper That's and computer paper. The, uh, the uh, media dropping of the ball. It's not too far. From that. It's not far, but this was the whole yeah, city. Broadway. We drove through. You can look on YouTube. There's videos of this. Day when this happened, and all these you see these taxi cabs driving through the ticker tape parade, and I was in one of those. <laughs> so, we were was giving you a big time. And, and, and he did me a big favor because I have a terrible memory for dates, <laughs> but I can always look up the date that I first took class with Margaret Craft <laughs> on Fifth Avenue across from the studio, and I immediately had an ulcer attack. Oh. oh. And I started, and it was so painful, I really couldn't oh, breathe. Yeah. It hurt so much I couldn't breathe, and I just started crying, and Mrs. Ashton looked at me and said, you don't want Miss Crass to see you cry. Oh, <laughs> oh my gracious. And no. it eventually passed, and then I pulled myself together, and we went into the studio, up to the, her studio, I think it was on the fourth floor, and we went in to take class. Now, Miss Crask, her children's class was very, very disciplined. All of the students wore pink tights, you know, pale pink, not shocking pink, pale pink, pale pink slippers, black leotards with their name embroidered large, in large letters along the chest, and then a white headband. I had forgotten my black leotard in New Hampshire, so I was wearing all pink. (laughs) But it was all I had. (laughs) So Miss Cross was very nice. She was loud. This was, I think, probably I was the only one who ever (laughs) wore a different outfit (laughs) in her children's clothes. (laughs) So we started the class. It was it was absolutely amazing. Because she would start the class with all of the children. We would all sit on the floor in the line. We would just, sorry, we would just sit on the floor like this, stretching our feet. And Miss Crass would walk along. So we were sitting on the floor, stretching our feet. Miss Crass would walk along in front of us and look to make sure everybody had their white headband, their black leotard, with the embroideries, you know, everything. No jewelry, like maybe little tiny earrings you could get away with, but nothing, nothing extreme. And uh, so then she would start off like that. Then the class would get up, 
I like to think this was like the eight monkeys that she was taking care of for Baba. Because <laughs> somebody asked her, oh, did they get, they were on leashes, and they said, did the leashes get all tangled up in this crest? Well, did and looked at this person like they were crazy and said, of course not. <laughs> I think that we were just like her eight monkeys, all the little kids, we all lined up, and then as soon as we got it, we formed a circle. And the circle was around this craft. And then we did this series of stretches. Did you say you had a leash or something? No, no, it reminds me about monkeys that she, when she was with Baba, she had to take care of something like yes, eight monkeys. Yes, yes. And they, they would have leashes. And somebody asked her, do they get tangled up? And she really looked at this person like they were insane and said, of course not. Because Miss Crass, she knew how to keep order <laughs> in her students and her pets okay. and her monkeys. <laughs> so so we, it was like that the class, you know, the, they would all go in a circle around her and then they would, we would do this whole series of exercises with her in the middle. And then from there we would go, we would do this one, like one step, kind of a, some kind of little dancing step, a, a jump in arabesque or something, just to kind of get the spirit of dancing up before we got serious. <laughs> so then from there everybody would just go to their place at the bar, it was all in order. <laughs> it was amazing, it was so incredibly ordered and, and, and everybody had their place. So, of course, since we were visiting guests, we were kind of, you know, in the back, I think, of the class. But, so then we went to the bar, and we, we did the, the bar, all the bar exercises. Um, there was a piano player, and this class, she wouldn't, uh, there wouldn't, if you watch other ballet classes, there'd be this whole elaborate, like, introduction before the, the exercise would start. With Miss Crass, there was none of this. Frill. <laughs> Just a no wall. frill. No, we would literally, you would be in position, you just knew when she was about to start, you would already be in position, and all she would say was, and. <laughs> and the music, and the exercise would begin, music would begin, and you were ready to go with the and, and the and was always a breath. <gasps> One, two, three. And one, two, three. And well, there was always a breath at the top and a breath at the bottom. So we did the class. Then after the bar exercises, we went to the center. And I think we do we did a little bit of back exercises. And then we got to my favorite part of the class, which was called the port de bras. And the port de bras is really just the head and the arms and they, mostly the upper body. So you don't have to worry about what the feet are doing. <laughs> we can finally just relax and dance. Just feel, just dance. It was very, very sweet and very... This class, her class was so full of love. So we, would, we got to this part of the class and, and then we, you know, we moved on to slightly more complicated exercises and slightly more complicated exercises. Finally, we got to one exercise that was like a, um, are we okay? It was, if, if the class ever got too heavy and serious, she would make a joke. Yeah. And make, and lift, she, so she could, she could like orchestrate the energy of the class oh, and the atmosphere of the class. She really could. So it never got like, because sometimes yeah. you know, your work is hard and you know, she would immediately, Say something funny to, to get everybody. You know, she did. She just. She has. She, uh, yeah, the border bra was the very, very simple. And then it, we got to we we did it. Followed that with an exercise that was again. It was the border bra, but this time we had to do. Uh, it was called a, it's called a bore, where you just. You just kind of move on the toes like this. So you just sort of skirt across the ground like that. <laughs> so we were, so Miss Crest was explaining this step because the porter bra was something like one, two, and three, four, and. Look <laughs> at those answers. And she was saying it was like a blade of grass in the room. Ah. And you know, I'm a tiny little 10 year old. And these things were really. 
it's so special yeah that somebody like her was explaining in such a such a magical way mm. that you really you really felt that you were like a blade of grass in the wind mm. and she gave you that very very special feeling mm -hmm. of, you know was that the feeling of what you were dancing not just doing an exercise but you were a blade of grass in the wind mm. and so she she explained that and then the music started and I started the exercise, we, as a group, we all started the exercise, and all of a sudden, I said to myself, oh, she's dancing next to me. <laughs> and I was absolutely certain that Miss Kratz had come next to me and was dancing beside me. And I kept thinking, while I was doing this exercise, I kept thinking, oh, what a wonderful feeling, she's dancing with me. Mm. And then we finished the exercise, and I you know, did it with the hands down, and then I looked up, and I saw this little old lady sitting in her chair. And I knew in that moment that there's no way that she physically got out of that chair, but she had been dancing next to me. Oh. And that was an amazing experience. Yeah. Just so special. Then we actually got to the the part of the class, my totally favorite class part, which was jumping. I loved to jump. <laughs> and I had a very big jump. <laughs> so at one point we were doing these jumping exercises and Miss Cress leaned over to Mrs. Ashton, my teacher, and said, Who's the little pink bunny? <laughs> Huh? <laughs> and she said, the little pink one. The little pink bunny, who is that? And she said, oh, that's Amy. <laughs> no, I was really tiny for my age. People took me for like six years old when I was ten. So I was little and pink. <laughs> because everyone else was in their black and guitar, and of course I was all in pink. <laughs> So that was our first class with Miss Grass, and it was wonderful. And the, the, the black cloud, of course, you know, was out of oh, my memory, yeah. away from you know, oh, mom, yeah. completely vanquished. <laughs> and I was so happy. I had one of the happiest weeks of my life. Oh. It was really extraordinary. Mm. And uh, the funny thing was that previous to that October, going to New York, I had gone into this severe depression. Mm -hmm. This was uh, Christmas 1968. Mm -hmm. This is when it started. Mm -hmm. And it lasted for several months. Mm -hmm. And I I couldn't, nobody could, you know, people kept asking me, Amy, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I couldn't articulate it, I couldn't, there was nothing specific that I could say, oh, this happened or that happened. But I remember finally one day, I said to my mother, I said, I don't know, but it feels like the color drained out of the world. Oh. The color? Drained out of the world. The color. Col the color. Yeah. The color. That was the only way I could describe the feeling I had around the time that Bob had brought the body. Yeah, right, right. And it was then, how many months later, that I got to meet Miss Crafts. So I had this really, really severe low. Mm -hmm. When Baba passed, and then that led so many months later to the English crash, to this incredible high. <laughs> incredible. It was really like the beginning of my life, 1965. Mm. So then uh, we stayed that five, six days, I don't remember how long, and we took both the professional class in the morning and the children's class in the afternoon with her. Mm. And then we went back to New Hampshire. And one of the first things I did was I bought a suitcase <laughs> and I put it in the corner of my bedroom and I decided that when I was 16 I was going to quit school and move to New York. Ah. That was my plan for my life. Ah. So I waited these long years. I got to go back to New York a couple of times to take, again, to take class with Miss Crash. Which town did you live in? I lived in Nashua. In Nashua. Yes, Nashua. In Nashua. Yes, Nashua. 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 Oh, wow, here we go. So when you go, went back with your teacher, with you, 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 this question, you went back mm -hmm. again, yes. again? Yes, and that's what we studied. We studied with her. We had a very small studio, 
So one summer she took us to Jacob's Pillow. Mm. Uh, beside our trip to New York, we got to go to Jacob's Pillow for one day, and Miss Crass taught there in the summers. And the studio that she taught in was a barn. So this barn was enormous, high mm. ceiling. It was a space, something we didn't have in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember at the end of the, the class, she gave us this big jump to do across the floor. Now, I was probably 11 at the, at the time, still very young and little. And the students at Jacob's Pillow were mostly college age. <laughs> You know, older, older students, and so uh, at the end, of, near the end of the class, when we did this big jump across the floor, Miss Grass stopped everybody and said, pointed at me and said, "You demonstrate this, oh. this jump." And I just remember having such an incredible time because I could fly in this room. Mm. This was the first time I actually had the chance to dance in a space where there was room. <laughs> room to jump. So that was very exciting. That was very exciting that she, you know, picked me out and you know, so Miss Crouch was just very special to me uh, all this time. And then finally in 1974, my ballet teacher, Mrs. Ashton, she had a son about my age. And she decided that he was going to go to this academy, dance academy in Illinois. And uh, that included high school and dancing. And then, so then I was kind of convinced that I should also do this. So I auditioned and they gave me a full scholarship. And I went off at the age of uh, 15 to, to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois to study at this school and I was, the plan was I would finish all of my high school years there. Well, I didn't like the school at all, I didn't like mm. the training, I didn't like the living situation, I didn't like Illinois. <laughs> so by the time I had turned 16, I had decided that I didn't want to be at the school anymore and they sort of decided that they didn't really want me anymore either. <laughs> Because I was a full scholarship student and I wasn't, you know, I just wasn't happy. I didn't act like a star student. I just wanted to be out of there. So we all decided to, you know, part ways. And then I was so happy because I remembered my dream of quitting school at 16 and moving to New York to mm. study with Miss Crafts. And so that's what I did. Mm. And it just happened. I'd forgotten about that plan, but it came back, you know, life's events just put me back on my path. So I went home, and I think my, my father went... The day he was in pain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was <laughs> almost like that. My, 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 I think my father said, you know, what are you going to do now? And I said, oh, I'm moving to New York. <laughs> <laughs> just study with Miss Crasky. And he said, no, you're not. You're going back to school. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and the next day, my parents were dropping me off in New York City <laughs> with my suitcase. <laughs> And that was that. It was 1975. And now I was going to study with this Crash full time and have a professional career. Blah, 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 blah. Well, the honeymoon with this Crash was now over. <laughs> 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 and I think I cried every single day. How oh my God, I couldn't do anything right. What about the love? No, my ulcer didn't really come back. It no. went away after that went, met her. that went away after I met her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was something about it. I just had to get I had to get that black cloud over <laughs> away. But so she literally was I couldn't move. I couldn't move without her saying, Amy and even if someone else made a mistake, my name was on the tip of her tongue and she'd say, Amy <laughs> And I was like, that's not even me. <laughs> I just couldn't do anything right. I, I went from feeling like such a talented, <laughs> special student 
to just think about this big, this little tiny thing on the floor for everybody to kick and stomp on. And, you know, I was 16 now, so I was supposed to, I guess, be able to take it. I, you know, I think it's the difference between being a pilgrim and being a resident of Maribyrnong. Or Marizana, or, you know, there's a big difference. Yeah, I think it was like that. So, so I was upset all the time. I couldn't do anything right. I couldn't figure out how to please Miss Craft. I just couldn't figure it out. So I kept thinking, what can I do? What can I do? And then I would every once in a while I would hear somebody whisper, blah 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 blah. So, and I was quite inquisitive, you know, so I was like, hmm, who's this Baba? <laughs> there was like this secret Baba. So I finally went to Ed Hank, one of the dancers, and I said, one of the older dancers, and I said, Ed, who is Baba? <laughs> and he said, oh, that's an Indian spiritual master that Mr. Crass follows. And I thought, oh. That's, <laughs> that's how I'm going to find out about Miss Crass. I'm going to figure her out by uh, by looking up this guy. <laughs> so I went to a like a Sufi bookstore. I think this was all Baba because how was I going to find the discourses, the little blue set of discourses of Mayor Baba? The 16 year old in New York City. I mean, it was incredible. So I found these books and I purchased them. And I swear I had just probably opened the book for the first time. I was sitting in the coffee shop underneath the ballet studio. This was 78 Fifth Avenue. And um, so I, there was a coffee shop that we would, you know, a lot of the dancers would stop and eat coffee or whatever you know, during their breaks. And so I was sitting down there at the counter, having a cup of really bad coffee. <laughs> the coffee shops in New York in those days had the worst. <laughs> it couldn't even be called coffee today. This was before Starbucks. This was long before Starbucks. So I'm sitting there drinking my bad coffee, and I opened up the discourse, the first one. And I'm, I have no idea what I'm reading. I have no idea anything about Mayor Bob. I don't believe in God. My whole family is atheists. <laughs> we don't believe in God. We, this is something so foreign. And Ed Hankel spots me. <laughs> and, he, and he sees me reading these books. And now, if you know Miss Crask at all, her approach to Baba was completely from the heart. And even Baba didn't allow her to read anything for many, many, many years. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, and she did not follow any kind of, she didn't believe in any kind of intellectual approach to Baba. Uh -huh. So when Ed Hankel saw me reading the discourses, his teeth almost fell out. <laughs> what? His teeth almost fell out. I'm just oh, kidding. You know what I mean? It was like... <laughs> so, because that was so... Unusual, to say the least. So, Miss, so he came up to me and he said, "Does Miss Kraska know you're reading that?" <laughs> and I said, "No." And he said, "Well, you better ask her to tell you about Bob." <laughs> so I said, "Okay, okay." So this is 1975. 1975, and you're about 16. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> I saw Miss Crask later that day. I was sitting on this little sofa you could sit on before or after class. And she came walking by and I just looked at her and I said, Oh, Miss Crask, would you tell me about Baba? <laughs> and she looked and she hit me on the head. <laughs> she said, she hit me on the head and said, Yes. <laughs> But you're going to have to take it far more seriously than your dancer. And I was like, oh dear. <laughs> now what have I got? I have no idea. No idea at all. So we made arrangements for me to go to her hotel room at the Laurelton Wellington Hotel. 
and I went, and I still remember when I got to her floor, her, I got to the door of her apartment, and it was open, which I found very strange, living in New York City with sitting with your door open. You should have had seven bolts. Yes, seven bolts. Yeah. Seven. And one of those police lock things, you know, and her door was wide open, so that was kind of interesting. And then as I was coming through the door, she said, oh, come in, come in. She said, and please turn on the light. So I went, okay, and I looked to my left, you know, and right, to see where there's a light switch. But I couldn't find a light switch. There was no light switch. So I sort of stupidly stood there in the doorway, and Miss Crest just said, oh, you are dotty, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I was like, oh, I'm about to start crying. Dotty? <laughs> dotty. Yes, I finally asked, I think I asked Ed. <laughs> what is dotty? What is dotty? And he said, oh, it's crazy in a nice way. <laughs> so I said, okay, okay. But in the moment, I had no idea what that was. I just, you know, I was useless. I couldn't do anything right. And I finally found the light switch behind the bookcase. It was ah. hidden behind the bookcase. So it, yeah, of course. So I found it, I turned it on, and then she said, Oh, you better shut the door so nobody comes in and murders us. Nobody comes in and murders us. She was such a mix of, she, you know, one second, you know, she, you, she'd have you this way, and the next second she'd have you that way. She was real wrong. Oh, shit. <laughs> So then I came in and I sat down with her, and she told me the whole story of the drop soul and the wind. Oh my gracious! Wow. And everything like that, and I knew it was absolutely true. Mm. And Baba was God, and then I mm. loved him mm. instantly. Mm. Mm. Absolutely instantly. And then we talked about a few other things, you know, my life and blah 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 blah. And then um, she was kind of like a mother to me. She really she worried about me. She knew I was living alone. I didn't really have any money, so I that food was something that I had very little of. <laughs> and you know, buying ballet shoes was like kind of beyond my means. So I. I'd sew up and tape up my shoes to try to get them to last a little longer. Did you walk in a restaurant? Well, I was too young at that time to work at a restaurant. Um, on my 18th birthday, I started working at restaurants. Mm. But before that, I would I would model new for painting classes. Because <laughs> I was old enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you model in a nude? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, for painting classes. Because she was old enough. Uh, yes, I'm 16 years old enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then Miss Krask asked me, this was my first meeting with her uh, in her hotel room, she asked me to choose a picture of Baba. And she handed, she opened up a drawer and she handed me this huge stack of photographs. <laughs> And I was very, I felt very um, unsure of, you know, this was something completely new. And and Miss Crass was watching me like a hawk. <laughs> and I'm sort of looking through this stack of photos, and I imagine the pictures were probably from India, and Mama mm -hmm. had probably touched them, because she'd had these photos. I imagine in this drawer many years. So she said, will you choose one photo? And I said, okay. And I sat there going through the photos. And then, of course, I saw the 1925 Baba. Uh, it's this beautiful, stunning, gorgeous fan. And I was very tempted to pick one of those. But then I thought, oh, Miss Grass is going to think I'm so shallow. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to carry on through the stack. And then I found one that sort of spoke to me. And I chose it. 
And Miss Krask took the picture and looked at it and said, Oh, you chose one that showed his sense of humor. Oh. Oh. Which one? One that showed his sense of humor. Oh. Which picture was it, Amy? It's one I've never seen anywhere else. <laughs> oh. And I still oh. have it in my bedroom. Yeah. Um, so I can see it all every morning and every night. Mm. And um, and I knew in the moment she said that, that she knew exactly what I had been thinking earlier when I thought, oh, she's going to think I'm shallow because, you know, I wanted an attractive one. And then, so, it, it was, it, it, whenever she spoke to me like that, it was, she was saying one thing, but she was saying 50 things. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was aware of that. So, um, then I heard afterwards, I heard from some of the older dancers <laughs> that Miss Crask had said that I really loved Baba. Oh. And she was quite surprised because it was just, it was instant and she said, I really loved him. Mm -hmm. And that was nice to hear. So then she invited, uh, she invited me to a Baba birthday party that they would have every year out at um, uh, Bunty Kelly. Uh, Bunty and uh, Margaret, Margaret Bernstein's parents' house. Mm -hmm. So I got to go to that Baba birthday party, and then I remembered uh, later on that summer, Miss Kresk had gone back to Jacob's Pillow to teach for the summer, and so I was taking classes with another student of hers, and I got up the courage to actually write a postcard or a letter to Miss Krask. And in the letter I said something like, oh, I'm working very hard studying and taking classes with blah, blah, blah. And Miss Krask sent back a postcard saying something like, uh, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact words, but something to the effect that I'm glad you're enjoying your lessons. Uh, I shall expect much improvement when I return. <laughs> Raising your ball. Oh, she just, you couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> Every time you opened your mouth, you were in deeper trouble. Deeper <laughs> trouble. <laughs> but little by little by little, I started to realize that she didn't hate me because I, at the beginning I really thought she, she, she didn't like, like me because mm. she, she was on me all the time, all the time, all the time and I just thought, oh, she doesn't like me. Finally, we were, I was at like a little party, one of the dancers in Houston, and then Ed Henkel saw that I was, I was very upset that night. And he looked at me and said, don't you understand masters are hardest on those they love the most? Oh. And that was this incredible oh, revelation. Don't you, re don't you realize? Masters are hardest on those they love the most. Mm. And that was the beginning of my coming around to understanding that everything Miss Crass was doing was coming from love, not from any kind of negativity, not, it was, it was, it was hard love, but it was love. <laughs> so little by little, I calmed down. I calmed down. And I remember like she was pretty amazing because one time I was very, very upset. Because my whole life was falling apart. My life was extremely difficult anyway, but this was a particularly difficult time. And so I just was really, really upset. And I was, uh, it was after class, I was in the dressing room crying, and I didn't want this class to sit. So I stayed in the dressing room. And I waited and waited and waited, looking at the clock to see you know, when she would be gone so I could slip out. And when I came out, I waited a long time. She should have been long gone. But when I came out, I, I stood in front of the bathroom door because I wanted to wash my face and clean myself up. And the door opens, 
and it's Miss Crask. <laughs> and she takes one look at my tear stirring face, and she said, oh, I we need to talk. <laughs> Which was exactly what I didn't want to do. <laughs> but so she dragged me into her dressing room. And then she asked me this whole list of questions. Are you eating properly? Are you sleeping well? Do you have enough money? Blah, blah, blah. It was this endless list. And everything she asked me, I was just like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then I, t I told her, I said, I just lost my roommate, and, and I don't have enough money to pay the rent. So, you know, I'm upset about that. And she, she said, oh, and I said, but it's okay because I'm supposed to meet somebody this afternoon who's a possible roommate. And she said, well, you better pull yourself together. You're going to frighten the dear thing. <laughs> And I remember too the first thing she said to me when I, you know, when she was reading this list, you know, coming up with this list of questions, she then said to me, Am I correcting you too much? Am I, you know, and I was like, Well, <laughs> kind of. And she said, Well, okay, then I shall not correct you anymore. And I was like, Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. I mean, that would. It would but so she was so good at, you know, kind of manipulating you because, of course, I didn't want her to ignore me and leave me alone. But, so she just kind of, you know, so, so then, uh, when I... I'll leave that to Jackie. Oh, is that what you did? Yeah. I'll you Okay, okay, <laughs> good. So then, um, but it was after I left that day, that I realized that every single question she had asked me was actually, yes, I wasn't sleeping well, yes, I'm not eating well, mm -hmm. yeah, but, but I was young and, mm -hmm. and kind of unconscious. And Miss Crass was slowly, slowly, slowly making me conscious of... The practical thing. Yeah. You know, she would ask me things like, what do you eat, my dear? And I would say, well, there's no food. What does anybody eat? So I have no consciousness of like, that you should eat healthy food <laughs> or anything like that. And I would dress in like little short shorts and a tube top and, and Miss Crass would run into me on the street and say, oh my dear, you're not wearing any clothes. <laughs> what, my dear? You're not wearing any clothes. <laughs> I have a tube top on and my little shorts. I'm wearing them. My, my mother, who was 97, <laughs> had a foot wash on. When she sees somebody with tiny clothing, and uh, I tell her, Mother, these are the poor ones. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have enough money to get the whole thing. <laughs> This was a couple years later. We were in the the point class. The point class was only the older women. You know, the older women, meaning, you know, I think I was the youngest one, and then the others were 18, 19, 20, you know. So uh, that class was, um, was we were on our, in our point shoes, the whole class. So it was just a women's class. And, uh, we were doing, I'm just realizing this now, we were doing the same step that I had done in 1969, a bore with a, a similar kind of border bra, we were doing, but on point. And um, we were doing this step across the floor, and Miss Crest had choreographed exactly. You know, it was the feet were doing the bore, and the arms were doing something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, very specific arm movements for eight count, and then to the other side, eight counts, 
and one more time, eight counts, and one more time, eight counts, and then we finish the exercise. Now, for the first and only time that I ever saw Miss Crass do something like this, she just said, now do what you want. Which, she never did anything like that in all the years that I was with her. And so the music, you know, she didn't give us a lot of time to think about it. She just said, and, and the piano player started to play the music. Well, everybody else in the class did a tiny variation on the same step we had just done. You know, they did the eight counts of bore one way with some kind of a port de bras, and then eight counts the other way with some kind of port de bras. The minute I heard Miss Cress say, do whatever you wanted, something inside me just burst. <laughs> and I started running around the room, dancing around everybody. <laughs> Spontaneous and unconscious. And when we finished, we finished and we got back to our place, and Miss Crass looked at us all and she said, Amy's the only one who did what she wanted. Oh. Oh. And that was such a gift oh. because I was always this sort of odd kid that didn't really fit in with anyone else. I mean, in the children's class, everybody else in the class had lived there in New York City and they had parents and they had family and they had school and school friends. And I was completely on my own. And even in the professional class, you know, they had, you know, it was just, I was just didn't really fit in with anybody. So it was really a gift, such an important gift to me that Miss Crass one thing I forgot to mention was in 1975, I went to my first Baba movie. And it was the Baba Group in Sharon Square in New York City. And um, because, again, Miss Kraft didn't really encourage the dancers to join other groups. We were all just, I think it was because we kind of, we had her. And she wanted to keep us following Baba in her way, which was from the heart, with laughter, with humor, with love. That should have been first. Love, laughter, humor. <laughs> um, so so it, I think that was part of it. So, so I think that's probably why nobody really went to these meetings, but she was speaking. So I wanted to go and hear her speak. And I remember going to the, the, the place in Sheridan Square and looking at the people and thinking, what a strange bunch. <laughs> <laughs> what an odd bunch of people. <laughs> and then I sat down in a chair and the program was starting and this man got up and he picked up a bell, it had to be this big, <laughs> which I found hilarious. <laughs> and he rang the bell to start the meeting. So now I'm actually like, this, this giggling is starting to come up. <laughs> because I don't know, I'm just feeling like this whole thing is so odd. <laughs> it's kind of odder by the minute. <laughs> And I, it's because being around Miss Crass, we were all so practical. She was so practical and so unaffected and so natural. And so here's these people at this meeting, and they were kind of odd <laughs> and a bit affected and quite unnatural. I thought. <laughs> and so I'm sitting in my chair, and then this man starts reading one of the discourses or something from from Baba that was clearly beyond his comprehension. <laughs> and somehow I found that even funnier. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there in this chair and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm trying to suppress this giggling. And of course, the more I suppress it, the more it's squeaking out. <laughs> and luckily that ended in this crass gave this beautiful talk. Beautiful, beautiful talk about Baba. And then I think they also showed a movie, one or two movies. And I remember there was one where this man was walking with Baba 
in kind of a, an open land. And every couple of steps, the men would get down on all fours and Baba would rest on his back. Oh, you know, God. Car. 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 Yeah. 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 So car. Yeah. What's the car? Blood no, 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 they said, what's the car? Blood disorder. Really? Not car. Really? No, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, and this, so this is the, the, the anyway. So this is the first footage I'm seeing of Mayor Baba. Oh. And <laughs> it was amazing because he didn't move like a normal person from this place to this place and this place to this place. What I was seeing in the film was that he would disintegrate and reintegrate and disintegrate and reintegrate and that's how he moved across wow. the screen. Wow. I've never seen that since, wow. but that was my experience of the first film footage of Mayor Bob. I was blown away. This press talk was fantastic. But when I got home later that night, I thought to myself, hmm, I don't know if this Baba thing is for me. I know I love him, but these people are so strange. <laughs> I don't think I can do this. <laughs> that was really what I was feeling. So the next day, I went to ballet class, thank God for Miss Grass, and Miss Grass was talking about the meeting. And I, it's funny because I don't recall that anyone else was there, but maybe someone had asked Miss Crass, how did your talk go? Or something like that. So that gave her an opening to say something like, oh, well, you know, these people walking around with their eyes in the sky saying, Jay Baba. <laughs> she says, I don't think they necessarily love Baba. But it was, you know, so... To me, what she was saying, even though she wasn't speaking to me, but she was saying to me yeah. that this is not necessarily what it's about. That it's that I don't have to be a part of that. I can come to Baba in my own way. And it was the most incredible thing because it allowed me to stay with Baba. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise I really was down. Turned off. I was very turned off. Very turned off. And um, and I pretty much stayed away from all of the group things after that until I came to India. Now that's another story <laughs> because uh, of course one of my other teachers was Tex Hightower. Mm -hmm. So I had Miss Crask, I think, okay, I had Miss Crask professional class uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings, and then I also had the professional pole class on Thursday. Then I had the children's class on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So I had a class with her almost every day of the week. Mm. But after the point class on Thursday, which was only women, Tex would teach a men's class. And we love to take us girls, we love to take Texas men's class. So we would, after the point class, we'd take off our point shoes and then we'd stay for the men's class. And uh, Tex gave us all men and boys names. <laughs> oh, how cute. How dear. <laughs> because we were, but he gave me a nickname anyway. Before this, he gave me the nickname of Amos. <laughs> and so that fit perfectly Amos. when we would take the, the men's class because he called uh, he called Stephanie Steve, and I was Amos already, <laughs> and uh, let's see, who else was there? There was uh, different names for the girls had different voices, and Texas class was hilarious. <laughs> it was like going to a comedy show. <laughs> it was the most wonderful class. He choreographed these incredible, incredible steps. You know, series of steps that we would, we would, oh, they were just fantastic. It was just incredible. And they were so unusual and so different than Miss Craft's class. And she had told him to make sure and teach a very advanced class. Because her class, it was a lot of set exercises. You know, we, the adage, these long, long, long things, we would learn and we would do the same ones, you know, over and over, over the years. But Tex, she told him to do something completely different, so he would choreograph these wild, exotic, you know, 
combinations and we would do those and his class was just so much fun. So uh, I became very good friends with Tex and I was also, of course, I loved Miss Crass very much and um, but I would watch Tex go to India almost every year. I think he went to India mm -hmm. from the time I met him in the 70s until many, many years later. Uh, it was something like 24 years later that I finally came to India. But I would see him go and... 99? Yes, 99. Mm. And the thing was that I had absolutely no idea to go to India. I would watch Tex go and I'd watch him come back. And I never thought, oh, I want to go to India, or I had no, absolutely no desire, no interest. It just wasn't in, in my mind. But the one thing that was in my mind was the fact that Miss Crass had told many of the older dancers, save your money because one day Baba calls you to India. So that was always in the back of my mind, that how can Baba call you to India? He's not even in the body. So that was somewhere in rattling around, rattling around for 24 years. That was rattling around in my mind. And then one morning, I was completely awake and I was sitting up in bed and this voice said loud and clear, it's time to go to India. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, that's and great. my first thought was, no one will think I'm crazy if I ignore that voice. <laughs> no one <laughs> will think I'm crazy if I, I ignore, ignore that voice. <laughs> My humor came up first, and that's what I thought, and that was immediately replaced by the knowledge that I had to go to India immediately, as soon as possible, no delay. So I had no money, my phone had been turned off because I couldn't pay the bill, so I took a bunch of quarters and I went down to the street corner. So I was still living in New York City. I went down to the street corner and my first call was to Tex Hightower. And I said, Tex, a voice told me it's time to go to India. <laughs> and he said, well, I think so too. <laughs> and I thought, oh, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> and then I said, how do you go to India? And Tex said, well, you can't go right now. It's just about to close for the summer. And I thought, oh, thank you, Baba. <laughs> because I had yeah. no, I, 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 could, I knew I had to go as soon as possible, but I had no way to go. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So Tex then, you know, said, oh, blah, 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 you need to get a visa. You need to go for two weeks. But add a couple days on either end for traveling, and you need to pack toilet paper, and you need to <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, okay, Tex, okay, I gotta go. And I hung up on Tex, and then I called my mother. My mother is retired, she never really made money in her life, so she's you know, living on a very limited income down in, I guess at that time, Atlanta. I can't even remember now uh, if she moved there yet. But So I called my mother, and I said, Mom, a voice told me it's time to go to India. <laughs> and she said, well, <laughs> when your sister turned 40, I gave her $1,000 to spend if she wished. Now you're just about to turn 40, I'll give you $1,000 to go to India. Oh, God. So within 10 minutes, Baba had it all arranged. <laughs> mm. I think I only needed to raise like $300 more. 200 more for the airfare and a hundred dollars for my stay for two weeks, you know, or something like that, maybe another 200. But you know, I just came with just, just enough to survive. And uh, I came in end of July. Mm -hmm. Now, my, I remember before that I walked into the, the MPC dining room for the first time. I had a flashback to that first Baba meeting <laughs> in Sheridan Square, New York, <laughs> and I thought, oh dear, <laughs> what are the people going to be like? <laughs> and I remember walking into the dining hall 
all sort of like looking around like <laughs> very suspiciously. <laughs> And then, of course, I met all these fabulous, wonderful, sweet, delightful people, and I, you know, I realized, okay, that somehow that first experience was just how Baba, I guess, wanted to keep me away from getting involved at that time. So, I was here, and uh, it was so interesting because of having had Miss Crask as my Baba connection, I didn't care about any of the other monthly. I had never given them more than a momentary thought. So I didn't know pretty much who anybody was. And of course I'm meeting Dr. Bonier, I'm meeting Erich, I'm meeting all these wonderful people at Marizade. And, um, and then one day I was at the morning prayers here on the hill. And it was about 15 minutes into the prayers. I all of a sudden thought, oh, I wonder if I'm going to get to go to a funeral. And then I thought to myself, oh, that's a strange thought. Put that away. I, like, I couldn't figure out why I thought that, because I wasn't fascinated by funeral pyres or anything like that. And Indian funerals were not like, on my list of interesting <laughs> subjects. So I kind of put it aside, and then after RT, I, we went down for breakfast. And right when breakfast started, somebody came in and announced that at 7.15, course had passed, and we're all invited to the funeral. Um. So I thought, okay, that's why I thought about a funeral at 715. And so we went to Monterey Mon Hall, and people sang songs, and we sat around her body, and then people were putting flowers on her and putting their head on her feet. And I thought, okay, well, I didn't know her, but I'm sure Miss Crask and Tex and all these other people, Brenda Mel and Peter Saul and Bunty Kelly, I'm sure some of the other dancers knew her. So I thought, I'll give flowers from them. So I went and I placed my head on her feet and I could place flowers on her from, from the dancers. And then they asked for volunteers. We took her to the fire and then they asked for volunteers for the fire watch, so I joined that, and that was where I met Biff Sofer, who told me that Korshin had been the last person alive who remembered hearing Baba's voice. Mm. And I thought, oh, so she was the one, somehow there was this whole connection with hearing Baba calling me mm. to India. Mm. And then, they asked for volunteers to separate the bones from the ashes, so I joined in that. And that was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. It was uh, just, we were covered in her ashes and holding her bones, and oh my god, it was amazing. And then we went up to the hill and we spread her ashes around the trees, and it was just such a, a joyful, moving experience. And uh, then, many years later, I read Rustam Bahalati, is that how you say Bahalati. Bahalati, book. And he talked about how Portia, at the end of her life, had been looking at the list of pilgrims who were coming to see who would be there when she passed. Oh, wow. And I felt, again, I felt this connection to my experience, and that somehow all that was meant to happen. And it also connected to a later experience I had when I went back to New York in 2001, the night before 9-11. The day before 9-11, I lived seven blocks from the World Trade Center, so that day I had this unusual experience. I never had this before where I felt like somebody was pulling me, literally pulling me like this. And I kept thinking, oh, I, I'm supposed to go somewhere. But it wasn't like, oh, you know when you have an appointment but you've forgotten it and you think, oh, I'm supposed to be somewhere. It wasn't like that. It was something completely unique to me. 
that it was almost like literally someone was pulling me. So I spent a good part of the day trying to figure out where I'm supposed to go. Where am I, where am I being pulled? Where am I, you know? So I thought, I just kept thinking and thinking and thinking and pacing back and forth for hours, trying to figure out where am I supposed to go? Where am I supposed to go? So out of the blue, somebody rang my doorbell, which nobody usually does. And they, I said, it was a friend, and they said, oh, we're going to go play music in the East Village. And, do you want to come with us? And I said, no, 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 I have to go somewhere, but that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally I said, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to go see a friend of mine. This friend of mine was a, was a bartender at the World Trade Center. Mm. And for five years, every time I ran into him on the street, he would say, Amy, come and visit me. Come and visit me. I'm a at this, this restaurant, blah, 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 at the World Trade Center. So I said to myself, oh, I'm supposed to go to the World Trade Center. This was September 10th, 2001. So finally, you know, at, at, in the evening, I looked at my roommate and I said, oh, I'm supposed to go to the World, I have to go to the World Trade Center. Do you want to come with me? And she said, no, no, I have to study, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay. So, I walked out the door and I walked down to the World Trade Center. And I went all the way down where this friend of mine was bartending and I found him. I found where he was and I said, hello, and he said, hello, and we sat down and I had a glass of wine and then he introduced me to a chef from Windows on the World that had just finished his shift. He just completed his shift and he lived in New Jersey. So this was down this restaurant was down near the path train. And so this man would stop it's there. In the underground? Underground, very yeah. far down. Yeah. And near where the 1993 bombing had been, the, the earlier bombing had yeah. been down there, Probably. in that area. Yeah. So he was he would stop and have a nightcap on his way home to New Jersey. So the three of us talked and even shared numbers. I, because uh, this chef, I was putting on a fundraiser for a play. I was putting on a couple of anti-war plays from the 19, 1960s at that time. And I was trying to raise some funds for the theater and the costumes. And so I was putting on a series of dinners. And so the chef said, oh, I'll cook one of your dinners. And so I had his name and phone number. And then finally around 11, 11.30, something like that, we all said, okay, good night. And we left and we started leaving and all of a sudden I, I head over by there was this big escalator that would take you up to the ground floor level mm. so I head over in that direction and I look and I see this chef is on the escalator and he's going up and I thought to myself wow I thought he was going home to New Jersey which was down but I didn't know him very well, so I kept my mouth shut, I didn't say anything, and I just watched him wander off towards one of the towers. And then I had, I was wearing a brand new pair of shoes, which had given me a blister, walking down to the center, to the World Trade Center, so I thought, oh, I'll take the subway one stop, rather than walk home. So I went wandering around the trade center. And I knew exactly where the subway station was, entrance, but I couldn't find it. I was like in this kind of a state of confusion where I could not find the subway station. So I'm kind of wandering around, wondering what's happening. And then I see the chef come wandering back from the tower. And I finally looked at him and I said, where are you going? <laughs> and he said, I don't know, I just got all confused. Wow. And I thought oh, I had to go back to work. Wow. But he said, but I'm finished. I'm going home, I don't have to come back till tomorrow after one o'clock. Oh. And so we just kind of stood there scratching our heads. There wasn't anybody around us, we were the only ones. And I thought, okay, I'll just walk home. <laughs> It's simpler. And he turned around and went back down the escalator and I went out the door. And the next morning, I was awake when we heard this plane go over mm. our head. 
And when it hit the Trade Center, our building shook like this. Mm -hmm. And I immediately knew that that plane ended, even though I couldn't see out the window because I'm only on the second floor, I said, oh, that's the Trade Center. It just hit the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. So I went out on the street and you could see the, the opening of the plane and there were people with scarves trying to, you know, wave, um, yeah, trying to get help waving out of the windows and and I thought, oh, that's so strange. That's so strange. This plane just hit the building. We thought it was an accident. So I went back home and I got my roommate. I said, you have to see this. It's so strange. So we walked out onto the street and we were standing, looking up at the towers from about seven blocks away. We just arrived at the corner when this huge fireball Mm. came out of the other building mm -hmm. and it was close enough you could almost feel the heat on your face the second, mm. the second plane but because we were on the other this side we didn't see the plane mm. we just saw this fireball it came from the west yeah from the south from the south it might have it probably came around yeah. and then yeah. to the south and then it was headed north mm -hmm. and so i remember just standing there thinking how could the fire jump from here to there? Because they look like they're close to each other, but they're... see the plane. No, we didn't see the plane. And so we were just kind of standing there watching all this. And then somebody came down from their apartment and said, Oh, it's, a, it's a, an attack and the Pentagon and the blah, 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 blah. And all this. So we, we basically just stood on the street corner and watched I, it didn't take long for the building to the first one to come well, down. Mm -hmm. well, it's it's to be it's like a pack of cars. Yeah. And we fall like a yes, well, we, we stood there. I stood there watching the building burning and burning and burning and the people waving their scarves. And, and then at one point I, I said to myself, oh, this building is going to come down. Like I, could, I knew. I knew that it was about to come down. And then. The, the tower sort of leaned over and then tilt, 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 the whole thing started coming down. But at that point, this huge black cloud came at us like a locomotive. Oh it was gosh. like a high speed train. It came mm. so fast and it was so thick. You could not see what was behind it. And my block happens to be the high pressure gas main for all of Lower Manhattan. And so I'm standing there on the street corner watching this come and I'm thinking, this was the only time I got scared. I thought, oh my God, it's explosions and it's all gonna blow up. And so it was coming towards my street. We turned and we ran like one block north, but somebody said, don't run, don't run because they were afraid somebody would be stampeded. So that was really great. Somebody did it. We all stopped and turned around. So now I'm one block north of my building, my block, and I'm seeing this cloud coming. And all of a sudden, I put up my hands and I said, Stop! <laughs> and the whole cloud stopped. <laughs> and went to Brooklyn. <laughs> 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 it was like almost like a cartoon. It just went <laughs> and the other way. <laughs> it was so remarkable. It was so remarkable. So of course, you know, we just we kind of carry on and carry on. You know, finally we they keep moving us further north because the next building's coming down and nobody knows what's going on. So we kind of. You know, we keep getting we pushed know, we know, further. We know, we know. Yeah, further north. But now we don't have, other than our keys, we don't have anything. We haven't even brushed our teeth yet. Because my roommate was in the bathroom when it all started, and I was waiting for the bathroom. So I hadn't even brushed it my teeth yet. Early morning, like at eight, your, eight o'clock. Your time. Yeah. 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 So, um, so we uh, we finally 
you know, we just saw the second building come down, and we, we saw people who had actually come from the buildings, and they were talking and telling their story, and there were people recording their stories, and so we were kind of in the middle of this whole thing. And then finally we decided, well, it looks like it's all calmed down, let's go home. Um, but they had closed off the area, the yeah. area, yeah. just one block north of me. Mm. So, on, uh, no, two blocks north of me, on Worth Street. But my building had a back entrance on Thomas Street. <laughs> so, and I had a key. So I knew if I could just get one block, I could get into my house. My kitty cat was there. We didn't have any identification on us. You know, we, we just wanted to go home. So we went, there was one building that had an entrance from both Worth Street and Thomas Street. This fancy, you know, office building. So I thought, okay, we're gonna go, let's go talk to the, to the security guard there. And we went in, and they were all, you know, everybody, of course, is up, up in arms. You know, there's all this drama, 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 drama. And so there were these people who right away sort of stopped us. And I said, oh, I said, look, look, we live right. I pointed to the other door on the next street. I said, we live right there. Can we go through? And they were like, oh, I don't know. You know, I don't know, because the police closed off the door. And they said, look, talk to this man. And this other man showed up. And he was obviously in charge. He was like the security in charge of the building. And I don't think he liked the fact that the police had taken hmm, the charge of him. <laughs> so when I said to him, I said, look, sir, we live right there. Can we go out that door? He was silent. And he just went. <laughs> and so we followed him to the door. And he made this huge gesture of taking out the key and opening the door. <laughs> Isn't that something? And opening the door and pointing like he a, had to be like out a the dancer. Key. Yes, like he took out a key and he unlocked the door and he let us out. And the police saw these two women, me and my roommate, saw us running out of this building on a street that was closed, but it was in the middle of the block and they were on this side and this yeah. side of this block. So they start yelling, ladies, ladies, you can't, you can't go there. And I had my key in my hand and I was, and I looked at my roommate and I just said, shut the door behind us. <laughs> and we ran and I opened the door and we ran in the building and she slammed the door behind us and so nobody could follow us because it was locked. <laughs> Um, but he lived right in the same neighborhood and his building was evacuated. So he lost his job, he lost his house, oh, but he was just just alive and he was happy. The chef? Yeah. The, no, not the chef. The, the chef was bar, the, bar, the bartender. The bartender. Yes, the bartender. And the strange thing was because from north of my street, everything looked normal. But when we got, my apartment is on the other the street, the one that has the high pressure gas main, and I have 22 feet of windows facing the south, where the World Trade Center is, and my windows were open, so my place was covered in this white dust, and the street in front of us, it looked like snow. It was all full of dust and all full of papers from people's desks, and it was the, that's where the cloud had ended, mm. but it wasn't behind us. So it was so strange walking into my place. I felt it was so surreal. Mm. And then uh, that night, we had all the electricity went off when Building 7 went down. And that night, we were just sort of sitting in the dark. My young, she was a much younger woman, my roommate and I. And, and we were, she, I could see she was getting a little bit depressed and we were, you know, that kind of feeling like you don't know what's going on, there's no television, no radio, no telephone, nothing. We're just sitting there in the dark. So the corner of my street had the military on one corner and the press on another corner and then there was some other group on another corner and there was one free corner. So I told my roommate, I said, grab some of the folding chairs, let's go down, and we made the residence quarter. <laughs> With our folding chairs, and we just sat there watching Lower Manhattan burn. <laughs> and people, it was great because other people from their apartments would come down and talk to us and join us. And it was really sweet.
It was very sweet. And then finally, I, you know, said I'm going to go to sleep. You know, just come in whenever you want, bring your chairs. And so I went in and went to sleep, and she came in later. And um, and the next morning we woke up, and she was very, very depressed. And I thought to myself, oh, I can't, I can't have this. We have to remain cheerful. So I was trying to think of what we could do to be cheerful. And I said, oh, let's dress up and see if we can sneak down and see what's going on. <laughs> because, of course, I was putting on this play, this anti-war play. So I had uh, all these military uniforms from the Second World War. <laughs> And my roommate just burst out laughing, and we, and then she decided she would be a nurse because she had a shirt that looked just like a nurse's shirt, oh and a green, that kind of pale green color, and she had white pants, and so she dressed up as a nurse, and I was a general from the second world. <laughs> <laughs> now we're laughing, we're rolling on the floor, we're laughing so hard. I mean, it was just. It was really a Baba story in a strange <laughs> way because we're keeping our spirits up during this really now, difficult all, time. All that came from Margaret. It, it came from Baba, it came yeah. from Margaret. Yeah. And, you know, it was, it was really, yeah. yeah, we had to remain cheerful. So we went out on the street in, in these hilarious outfits. I mean, I even had a cap <laughs> and I had binoculars for the Second World oh, War. Wow. These huge brass binoculars. Yeah, they were useful. <laughs> well, they were so nice because... And you took on the street? Yeah, because they, they, you actually couldn't see anything better through them. They just made them look like a 19 silent film with the kind of rounded sides. You know, the rounded shape of the film. And so it was kind of sweet and rounded everything. And, um, and we went out on the street. The minute we hit the sidewalk, this photographer got down on her knees and went... <laughs> Us, which I have no idea where they <laughs> And then we went down to the, because now they had moved the barricades from north of me to now two blocks south of me. And towards, towards, towards the, the center. trade center. It was now on Chamber Street. So we went down to the blockades on Chamber Street, thinking we'd just walk right in, general <laughs> while in the reporting, <laughs> and nurse. Uh, whatever, you know, and, and Nurse Nightingale, Nurse Nightingale and General Wong, and they just, they just looked at us and were like, <laughs> yeah, 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 there was no way we were getting through. <laughs> but so then, you know, we ended up, I ended up becoming a, a rescue worker and spending several weeks working at the Trade Center. Wow. And so I would spend 12 hours in my dusty apartment with no lights and no electricity and no food. And, no, and then I would spend 12 hours a day down at the World Trade Center where we had air conditioning and lights and food and telephones <laughs> and oh, everything that I ever want. And, um, and I was in charge of setting up the generators and, and putting, uh, I'd take five gallon cans of gasoline and fill them up yeah, every yeah. morning and then I and I would turn off the lights in the morning and turn on the lights at night and so that was part of my job. And so I was down there and there were times I have to say there was one the first day that it rained, which was 9-11 happened on a Tuesday. So it was probably about Friday or Saturday or something that it rained for the first time. And it was the most depressed sad atmosphere you could ever imagine. But that was the day that I saw, in my mind's eye, I saw Baba mm. walking around the rescue workers oh. and cradling people and, mm. oh my God, it was, it was incredible. So it was like the saddest day was the day that I really felt Baba there. Mm. And that was, so that was my 9 11. <laughs> but I was going to say, because I had been at the funeral of Korshed, we could smell the bodies burning. 
And but because I had been at Korshit's funeral, it, the whole idea of burning bodies oh. and oh. didn't disturb me. It was a completely sacred experience. It was some other kind of experience. So Baba had given me that experience, I felt, in part to prepare me for this. But the atmosphere after 9-11 was incredible. Um, you know, other than the, the one or two days that were so, so sad, so sad, so sad. Otherwise, there was a sense of community. Oh, absolutely. And people were helping each other and loving each other. And that it was just unbelievable. And then I kept seeing, you know, um, notices for those interreligious gatherings. Everybody, you know, they would have ministers and priests and, and you know, all, the banking, all the different groups praying together. And I thought, wow, that's really what Baba wanted. And then I also realized one day it dawned on me that, oh, this all happened 11 days after Eric mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. So that, you know, when that hit me, you know, it just, it all of a sudden became something profound and sacred and different than what, you know, the press and the news and, you know, all that was kind of making it. So it was very, it was actually something really amazing. It was amazing to be right there in the middle of that. And um, so that's just one of the things Baba put me in. Another time I was coming to India with another dancer who studied with Miss Crass. It was her first trip to India. Her name was Melinda, is Melinda Buckwalter. So this was 2008. And we're flying into Mumbai. The stewardess gets on the intercom and says, Ooh, there are explosions in Mumbai. Be oh, careful. That that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, boy. So my friend who is her first trip to India looks at me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> So we end up landing in the airport in the midst of all this craziness, and we can't get the car that we were supposed to have, so we negotiate another car. That was the Taj Mahal and all that. And so we had this whole adventure getting to Maribad. It took us all night. We were constantly being surrounded by ragtag groups of men with with rifles everywhere we went. We would just be surrounded by all these men with rifles and I'm like, Mayor Baba, Mayor Baba, Mayor Baba. <laughs> Showing them our Baba pins and pictures. We're just like a Baba, we're just like a Baba. <laughs> and luckily we had all we knew was that there were explosions. We had no knowledge that there had been people shooting. So we were protected. But the problem was the car we negotiated the tires were completely shot. Oh, no. And two minutes outside of the airport, the guy pulls over the driver and he goes out and looks at the tires. And my friend is like, these tires are terrible. I said, oh, it's okay, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> so we get all the way to Pune, and then we just, we, we had kind of along the way, we had decided, let's go all the way to Marathon, even though we don't even know where it is and the driver doesn't know where it is. We said, just head towards on another, we'll find it, we'll find it. So we're driving, we just left Pune, and we're driving towards on another, and the tire bursts oh. on the car. So we get out of the car, and now my friend, she's, she's been holding on like this the whole ride, and now she gets out of the car and she won't get back in. <laughs> and I'm like, come on, Melinda, please, let's get to Maribel. She's like, no, I want to go back to Pune. I'm like, no, 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 let's go, let's go. <laughs> we get, he's, the guy's changing the tire. The tire he puts on is even worse. <laughs> Baba's <laughs> travels reenact it because Baba travels on those kind of tires. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So we finally get her back in the car and we carry on. Uh, two minutes after we change the tire to this worst tire, we go by a bus. 
that is flipped over. <laughs> there are people hanging out of the windows, oh, yeah, and the tire it. is burst and uh, spinning. Oh, what would you say? I think that it does. Months. Just minutes after we got in the car with this really now even worse tire, we drive past a bus that is flipped over. Oh. There are people inside the bus. It's upside down. People are in the bus, and the tire has blown and is spinning. Oh. So now even the driver was like, "Oh my God!" You know, he pulls over. As soon as he sees a flower seller, he pulls over, puts flowers in the car, lights the incense, does a prayer, and then we carry on. <laughs> now, my friend is like, oh my god. <laughs> she told me she took Baba's name the entire night. The entire night. <laughs> so we're driving along and driving along. We have no idea where we're going. Every town looks like the last town in the last village. And of course, we don't read the Hindi, so we don't know where we are. And all of a sudden, I look up and I see this sign, Mayor Baba Samadhi, this way. <laughs> and I was like, stop, 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 stop. And the driver wasn't going to stop. I said, please stop. There's a sign. So we pull over and I take the driver and walk back like a quarter mile to the sign and he reads the sign and then he talks to somebody and they say, oh yes, 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 Mayor Bob Samad, you go here, you go here, you go here, you go here. We end up on this road. I have no idea where this road is. It was like this country road and it took forever to get to the, you know, I don't know where we were and how we were coming. I could not recreate this event. <laughs> But finally, after the longest time, we see the NPR, like wow. Oz, <laughs> you know, in the distance. And yeah, I'm like, oh my god, we've arrived, we've arrived, we've arrived. Well, the, the, the important part of the story was later on, I realized that that night, that day, that we went to the oldest, was Miss Crass' birthday. Oh. November 26th. Mm -hmm. And, she, and we were coming, two of her dancers were coming into the this Oh, wow. Is that a while? Yeah. Yeah. November yeah. 26. When did she pass away? Oh, she in the body? 1990. No, she was not in the body. No, this was 2008. But it was her birthday. Wow. I only realized that later on. I said, oh, wait a minute. It was Miss Cross's birthday. <laughs> Maybe you would do lies, you take the look. Really? Yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm pretty much. Oh, me? Yeah, we, we, we might get more out of touch. Oh, but it's okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.